up, people? Rasat Dad here in Singapore. It's kind of a dreary Tuesday morning, but we all good. It's, it's, it's you know, we're still kicking it. Um, been thinking a lot about my website, been thinking a lot about the programs I offer. How do I explain myself? You know, all those elevator pitch things. It's been coming up again lately. But then on top of that, I have like a memo pad full of notes and episodes that I want to do and I haven't had a chance to record them all yet because why? I like to do things live, don't I? Um, anyway, so I just wanted to go ahead and jump on here and talk about the fact that these elevator pitch got me thinking, right? And I look at the bios and the profiles and everything that I've got going on because honestly, my next goal is to start speaking more, to uh, to deliver speeches, to actually, you know, speak to crowds, to groups, to, to uh, individuals. Uh, because I do love coaching. I do love talking about all these things. But more than that, I really want to make sure that people understand there is a way out. There is a way to manage all of this chaos that they seem to find in their lives. And unfortunately, that main person that needs to learn to manage is you. You can't tell people how to do things. They're not going to do it unless they're good and ready. So if you're ready for a change, it's got to start with you. Anyway, so I was looking at my profile on Instagram and I talk about black and white and gray in, in Instagram. And I've talked about this before. Like I, I believe in gray. I really believe that there's no set way to do things. It depends on what you believe and how you believe that the world operates and your beliefs and what your behaviors become because of your beliefs and then your thoughts that follow and then your actions, all of that stuff. Everything is related. It starts with your beliefs. And because of that, I really, really believe in gray. So the I think if you boil down the essence of what I am and what I do, I teach people to manage the gray. I help you manage your emotions. I help you manage your actions and your um, your thoughts after that. If you can manage your emotions, you can manage the situations around you. You can manage the conversations around you. Managing. It's all about managing. And for me, honestly, mental health is broken down into your emotions and then your human resources. Like, um, how do you manage crises? How do you speak to people? How do you draw boundaries? How do you make sure that, you know, um, people respect you and then you respect them in return? How do you make sure that you are yourself no matter where you are? That authenticity comes from managing your emotions and managing your human resources around you, which means the people that are around you as well, the way you relate to them, all of that stuff. It's either, I don't know, HR could be human relations and human resources as well. I think it kind of both goes both ways, but Honestly speaking, it comes down to managing the gray. Uh, case in point being that, you know, uh, I love that that idea that one man's meat is another man's poison. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. All that stuff is like cliche stuff, but it's real because you may find someone attractive because you're into them. You you like them. Something about them makes you feel good, so you suddenly feel them feel that they are more and more attractive because let's look at this. I was very attracted to my husband when I first married him, and then as time went on and we started fighting more, we just didn't get along, he seemed less and less attractive. Because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It depends on how I feel about being around you. If I start to feel small and insignificant and useless, I'm not going to want to be around you so much anymore. And I'm going to start picking apart the things that you look like, the, the physical attributes of your of your persona, right? I'm going to start picking them apart because I'm angry with you. I don't, I don't feel so great. I don't feel so happy when I'm around you. So I'm going to start picking them apart. When I'm in love with somebody or I, um, I really love being around somebody and they make me feel like the sky's the limit. Okay, maybe not the sky, but imagination's the limit, that I could accomplish anything. They see like see me as this amazing person and I feel it from them that I feel like this amazing person. Suddenly the littlest things are so attractive. Like the way they scrunch up their nose when they look into the camera or maybe the way that they speak or they giggle sometimes um, when they're looking through their phone. It could be anything, honestly. But the bottom line is when you are interested in something, it's amazing. You could go on forever. And when you're disinterested, nothing could get you to turn your head in that direction because you could care less. It's very, very simple. It comes down to you. So when I talk about gray, one situation in one specific moment in time, you may feel like this is all I can do. I can't get out of bed. This is the best that I can manage is to sit here with my eyes open and at least start trying to think good thoughts. That might be the best you can do. And if you were to pick a different moment in time where the circumstances are similar, depending on how you feel, you might be able to throw your legs over the side of the bed, jump out of bed and run to the bathroom because you feel good and you're excited about what's going to go on that day and you've been feeling good for a couple of days now. So it's always gray. Uh, maybe you were raised believing that if you do A, then B will happen and B is the ultimate goal for you or you've been taught that B is the ultimate goal, so you strive for B. Uh, for me, case in point would be... Um, Go to school, get married, get a job, start a family. 
sorry, maybe that's backwards a little bit. Go to school, get a job, get married, start a family, right? That was that was the order of the thing. That was the ultimate success was to have a family at the end of having done the school stuff, done the work stuff, found a partner, and then start a family. And I did that exactly in that order to the best of my ability. And guess what? That wasn't the end goal. I did everything I could in my power not to be a single parent. And guess what? That's who I was meant to be. And I'm okay with that. Well, good. Look at me now. I mean, like, you know, I think I'm killing it. I don't know. <laughs> Depends on the day. Today, not so much. But anyway, the point being that I did it the way I was told I needed to do it and found that that was not the way that me specifically in this body, in this life is not meant to do it. I was told that, you know, you're not supposed to, um, oh my gosh, what is, what am I reaching for right now? There's a certain way that you're supposed to pray right? You go into a temple, you go in with your right foot first, you go stop in front of um, Ganesha first because he's the remover of all obstacles and then you make your way around the temple. And then you at some point get in front of the, the nine planets, you're supposed to go around the nine planets in a multiple of three as you pray and everything. And uh, eventually you uh, you show fire to the gods, you know, an Archino of some sort, and then you bow out, you leave, right? But guess what? That's not the way I pray when I'm by myself. I go to the temple because it's a holy place. I feel the vibrations there. And I'll find a small corner. After I after I step in with my right foot and everything, some some dad have his die hard step in, excuse me, with my right foot. I may go and stop in front of uh, Ganesha for a moment. But at some point, I'm gonna go sit in a corner somewhere and I'm just gonna absorb the vibrations. I'm just gonna sit there quietly. Not necessarily meditating. I don't even know if you can call it meditating. I'm just going to exist for a moment. I'm just going to exist for a moment. I'm not even with people watching. I usually have my eyes closed. I usually just leaning against something and I'm just taking in the atmosphere. I'm taking in the vibrations, the peace of that place. And you know what? That works for me. Some people feel like they are going straight to hell if they don't do this in a certain way. It's got to be clockwise. If you don't, you know, see this deity in front of this deity and then you don't like do this in this particular order and you don't do the line lamps and like, yo, you do you. That's cool. But I don't need that kind of limitation on me. This is how I pray. My mom used to get mad. In the morning, the first thing you're supposed to do is, you know, before you listen to any kind of rap music or whatever, you're supposed to listen to budgeons because you're supposed to raise the vibration of your room and the house and make sure that you set the day, the intention for protection and, and blessings and all that. That's cool. You do you. That's fine. Me, I really like solfeggio tones. I don't know if you know what that is, but they're, they're tones at specific... Uh, frequencies that help to align with your chakras and they vibrate with specific chakras. I am spiritual. I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, but I do follow some religious practices because the vast majority of my family is religious, yo. I mean, I'm not going to not do it. I will participate where I see fit, but the point being that if I need to clear my head, I'm going to use solfeggio tones. If I need to start the day off, I'm going to start with music in the morning and usually something upbeat because, believe it or not, in that melody somewhere, there is a tone that resonates with your body that makes you feel good. It's like good vibes. Obviously, once you have like, you know, some traumatic experience with that particular music playing in the background, it will never feel the same again. But for the most part, music is how I reset my body. Music is how I reset my mind. But do you see the gray in that? There is no set way to do anything. And any situation presented over and over again can have different meanings. People talk about crying, right? Yeah, okay, cry. But did you know that the different emotions that come with crying have a different crystalline makeup? So if you looked at the salt crystals that come out of your tears on any given moment, if it's tears of joy, if it's tears of pain, if it's tears of relief, all of those crystalline formations are very, very unique. They're different. But the emotion is the same. No, the emotion is not the same. The crying is the same. The action is the same. There's gray there. I don't have a favorite anything, literally. I have a mood, but I don't have a favorite anything. Um, and it really depends on my mood. So that is a lot of gray for me. I may be in a funk one day and be eating cereal for like a, a week straight. I love cereal. And after a while, I can't look at another bowl of cereal. I will be sick. But that doesn't mean that I hate cereal, it's just that right now I can't do it no more. It's a mood. It's gray. I've heard of so many people that were raised in one religion, and somewhere along the way as they questioned things and asked for answers and, and 
dug a little deeper into the why and wherefore of the way they do things, they found a different religion or they gave up on religion altogether. And it doesn't mean that they've changed as a person to become bad all of a sudden. They've learned to live in the gray a little bit more. There are less restrictions, less limitations. They found a way to cope that makes them feel pretty decent about themselves and they're making their way through life. There is no right or wrong. There is productive and there's destructive. There's hopeful and there's uplifting. But it's different for each person. What may uplift me may not uplift you. I happen to like Gary Vee. He curses a lot. He cusses you out. He makes you feel like shit. But you know what? That anger that brews up inside me where I'm like, you know what, Gary? I got you. You watch, damn it. That's productive for me. A lot of people, their go-to emotion is not anger. Their go-to emotion is sadness and depression because they start beating themselves up about what's going on. Me, I'm a fighter. I'm going to prove you wrong. Damn it. <laughs> it's I'm a home my beer kind of girl. Okay, maybe not home my beer. Like, let me take this shot real quick and then you watch what happens next. It, it's almost like that. But some people don't do that. Some people, their go-to emotion is sadness. Their go-to emotion is to break themselves down because how could they possibly let this happen? And why is it happening to them? They must be terrible people. That's how their, their mind works. And, and trust me, I know because I've been there before. Sadness was my go-to for a while. This helpless, I can't, how do I even begin to change this? Like it's not in my hands. This karma, I must be worthless for this to keep happening to me. Like how could this continue happening? I must be so bad. I must be the worst of the worst. That karma thing, damn, that shit is some guilty shit, I'm telling you. But I've been there. And now it's not so much about karma. It's like, don't tell me what I can't do. Don't put down rules. <laughs> Now I have a problem with authority. Okay, not now. I've always have I've always had a problem with authority, but now I fight back a little bit more. But it's still gray. There's no right way or wrong way to do anything. You gotta chase your joy. You gotta chase that happiness. And that will show you what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Because ultimately, as many rules as there are, the rules of how you need to do your job, the rules of how you need to engage with people. Oh my god, can I tell you when I came to Singapore, the rules with which they use um, to speak to each other, what they consider courteous and respectful here. Oh my God, so not respectful in the U.S. It's so disrespectful. And the way they speak to each other does not sound like they're actually being nice or kind at all. It sounds blunt, brash, and rude. It sounds rude, crude, and socially unattractive. But that's normal here. It doesn't make it right or wrong. It's just normal here. It's gray. Everyone has their own culture. You ever had that moment where, you know, you thought your family was this shit. It was awesome. Everything that happens in your house is just amazing. I love the way my parents do things. I love the way my cousins do things. I love the way we visit each other. This is my family. Yo, I love it. And then at some point you have the chance to go visit maybe a schoolmate's family. You maybe stay the night, slumber party or something, or maybe a party at all, you know, go over there and, and celebrate a birthday or something. And you suddenly see that they do things differently than you. And you suddenly start to question, well, how come they do that and we don't do this? Or how come we do this and they don't do it? And you start to question and suddenly you see that, you know what? Maybe there's a different way. Maybe there's a better way. I don't know. Never considered it because your way was all you knew. And suddenly there's room for gray. So I would consider myself a protector of the gray. Because you need that space. You need that ability to make your mind up for yourself to find what works for you because you are not the same as your brother your mother your cousin you're not the same as your aunts and uncles you're not the same as your college roommate your high school best friend your first boyfriend you're not the same as them you have your own thoughts you have your own mind you have your own likes and dislikes what you think is beautiful fashion wise is not going to be what your friends think are beautiful fashion wise there's going to be a clash at some point you're going to want to wear I don't know army boots and they're going to think it looks stupid but you're going to do it anyway and they're going to love you anyway but they still think it's stupid we need gray we need gray we need that grace we need that space we need the ability to make up our minds for ourselves and yeah you know what we need a little bit of a a system in the beginning to help keep us safe so we can get to a place where we can think for ourselves. 
I believe you need the friction in order to decide you want to make up your mind for yourself, that this is not good enough. To all those people that have dragged me to a church somewhere along my life, where I had to sit through a sermon where people told me that if I did not accept Jesus into my heart, I was going straight to hell. And I felt minuscule and insignificant, like my life didn't matter because I wasn't raised to believe in Jesus. I wasn't raised to believe that he is the only God. And suddenly I felt like, damn, I'm going straight to hell because I don't believe this. I wasn't raised to believe it. I believe he exists. I believe he was a prophet of some sort. I believe he was somebody who was led here on earth to lead all of us and to teach us that love is the only way to live. Because isn't that what he did? He showed us that love was far more powerful than power and fear and control. If I had never been to a church, I wouldn't realize that, you know what? Religion really isn't for me. I'm spiritual. I'm ecumenical. If I hadn't been to communes where people talk about, you know, love and, and, you know, flower power. Okay, not flower power. I'm being silly now, right? I'm being very, very rude. Okay. But places where people talk about, you know, the essence of things, the energy, the feeling of things. I wouldn't realize that there's a part of that that really resonates with me, that really makes me feel bigger than I am. It helps me expand a little bit more. If I had never had like long conversations in the Grand Hyatt lobby with somebody who took the time to speak to me about Judaism, I wouldn't realize that there are so many different things that you could be doing, so many different ways you could do things. If I hadn't, oh my gosh, if I hadn't read Paradise Lost, if I hadn't read Shakespeare, if I hadn't read, oh my gosh, there's so many classics out there. If I hadn't read as much as I have, I wouldn't realize that there are seven circles of hell and, you know, um, the seven deadly sins. And there are so many different versions of life and heaven and hell and what happens after you die and all of these things. To the point where now I've adopted this idea that, you know, maybe it's like a jail sentence. Maybe you do a lot of crazy things here on earth to trying to manage your life, you know, and you build up some karma. And when you die, you go to hell first and you serve your sentence based on how many crimes you had. And then eventually all of us go to heaven. That sounds kind of nice to me. That sounds doable. <laughs> it's not so terrifying. It's not so final. And then I have, I've had this period of time where I, I believe that, you know, our punishment was to be here on earth and we're just trying to find our way back home afterwards. All of that works. That's cool. I believe in reincarnation. I believe we keep coming back because it makes me feel good to know that, you know what, when my loved ones pass, they do come back here on earth and they do come back as familiars and people that I, I click with instantly and they're here to guide me on my way and I'm here to guide them on their way and we just continue to see each other there is no end i like that idea i like the idea that the soul is eternal so from black and white of what hinduism says and christianity says and jewish people claim and and buddhist belief and all of that stuff i've kind of gotten a hodgepodge of beliefs and this is how i feel good about my life the essence of my life is about love and I'm happy to protect the gray for all of you so you can find your way. You can find beliefs that make you feel good about yourself. People joke when they talk about terrorism and Muslims. I hate that they always attach Muslims to terrorism. It's not like that at all. But can you imagine if you were raised from the time you were born till you're an adult and you were taught to believe that, you know, if you don't do this, this and this in this particular order, you're not going to go to heaven, which means this, this and this. Heaven means uh, please don't quote me on this. I have no idea what these people have been told, but you know, these, these virgins that are waiting for you in the afterlife, or you will clear your whole family's debt, or I don't know, whatever they've been told that they need to do in order to save their family and save themselves, they're doing it. Does that really make them a terrorist or misguided? Because they haven't been able to, to open their minds and consider various ways of living because they've only been raised with this one idea. Isn't that more detrimental? Isn't that scarier? 
Isn't that what a cult is? You give up every idea of everything around you and you only listen to this one thing. But you're being forced to do that, which means if you have questions come up along the way, you're not allowed to go off and check it out for yourself. So when you're controlled to that degree, why wouldn't you believe that that is the beginning and the end of your life and you have to do these things in order to save your soul? You see? Pray. I hope this makes sense, you guys. It's been on my mind a lot, and I'm really glad that I get to speak about it on this podcast. But I would really love to have the discussion, meaning to say that if you have questions, please message me. And if you want to shoot me down, please message me. I want to know. I want to know what the general consensus is out there. How does the general public feel about gray? Is that a concept you even consider? Because if you did, compassion would be a little more natural for you guys. Anyway, rant over. I hope this helps. I love you guys. And I will catch you again soon. Bye.